Honorable Turkish Consul General, Mrs. Sinem Mingan, the Turkish Commercial Attaché, Mr. Ahmed Nejati Karishman, today's valuable guest speakers, Mr. Rocco Rossi, President and CEO of Ontario Chamber of Commerce, and Mr. Mike Ward, the Executive Director of Canada Turkish Business Council. The respected members of the network of Azerbaijani Canadians, Mr. Anar Jahangirli, Mr. Dimitri Krilo, Ms. Nika Jabieva, and Mr. Farha Tajiev. The former president of Brampton Board of Trade, Mr. Badar Shamim, and dear board members and the volunteers of TEPAC and our extinguished guests. Welcome to this year's last TEPAC Talks event. We are very honored to have you all here today. Before we get started, I would like to express our sincere appreciation to all our TEPAC Talks event series sponsors who generously helped us make this event come together to become a success. Our main sponsors, GSK Personal Injury Law and Canada World Logistics, design sponsor, Flame Food Plus Design, Printing sponsor, Saman Design. Beverage sponsor, Urla Fine Foods. Media sponsor, Squirrel Production, Kanada Geyikleri and Turkish Voice of Canada. And our catering collaborator, Deno Delight Bakery. We couldn't have done it without you. Please note this event will be recorded and shared on our YouTube channel. Now, let me welcome the founder president of TEPAC, Mr. Nedim Duzani for his opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, our friends, welcome. And this is the last event of uh, TEPAC Talks and also TEPAC of this year. This is the third event of the TEPAC Talks. I don't want to repeat the thanks again because you shot told all the thanks but I will thank from my heart. And without participation, any organization cannot live. And we did last 10 years from the scratch. We started with five friends. Today we have many followers and every event we are doing successfully. With the sponsors, with the participants, with the volunteers, with the board members, and for the next year, our 10th anniversary, and also 100th anniversary, centennial year for the Republic of Turkey. We have new surprises for you for the next year. Our aim to become more institutional, more organizational, and more inclusive. We are non-political organization, but we have political opinions also, like everybody else. And from Turkey to Canada, or Canada to Turkey, there's a lot of things to do. We are on the beginning. We can easily double or triple, and we will. But we are the civil organization, and there are a lot of different components of that. And I thank you for uh, Rossi and the mic, and this is our flagship event of this year, and I hope everybody will enjoy it. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Now, we would like to invite our Turkish Consul General, Ms. Sinem Mingan, to the stage. Good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to address such a distinguished crowd consisting of Turkish and Canadian business people working together to enhance our business ties. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to TEPAC for organizing this event and also for working continuously and for their commitment to bring together entrepreneurs from various sectors uh, develop networking, pave the way for new partnerships between Canadian and Turkish businesses. And I believe they also uh, deserve an applause 
for their continued support to women entrepreneurs and young people, students and new graduates, uh, whom I believe have a uh, big uh, contribution in our relations. And uh, this evening we are, uh, I, I won't talk much because I'm also looking forward to hearing from dear Rocco Rossi and Mike Ward, who are the head of two important organizations, Ontario Chamber of Commerce and Canada Turkey Business Council. They are actually two of my favorite people in Canada. Both great friends and always reliable partners. When I heard about this event, I said uh, TEPAC picked the right people. And we are lucky they accepted the invite because I know Rocco's calendar is almost full and Mike kindly came all the way from Ottawa. Thank you for joining us this evening and thank you for your continued support to strengthening uh, business relations with Turkey. We are uh, actually, uh, Canada and Turkey are uh, two long-standing partners and NATO allies who will celebrate their 18th anniversary of diplomatic relations next year. And uh, we are looking forward to a promising term ahead of us because uh, leaving the pandemic behind us, we are working together for the second joint economic uh, committee meeting along with business forum in Toronto. We are very happy to see that mutual investments are on the rise and uh, trade uh, delegations are back on track to explore new opportunities. So I believe that this event is timely and it will provide insight and new perspective to everybody. Thank you once again to TEPAC and their volunteer team and also our distinguished speakers Rocco and Mike. I wish you all a pleasant and fruitful evening. Now, we would like to invite our Turkish commercial attaché, Mr. Ahmed Nejati Karishman, to the stage. So, good evening, everybody. My name is Ahmed Nejati Karishman. I am the old and the new commercial attaché. So, that means that, you know, uh, I arrived like September 2020. But because of the pandemic, we didn't have a chance to meet uh, most of, you know, our friends here. But, uh, you know, uh, I feel that, you know, uh, I'm a lucky commercial attaché because I started my work with, my, uh, with our previous attaché, Mr. Mehmet um, Ekizoğlu. And also I feel lucky that, you know, uh, because I have a, a general consulate like Sinan Mingan. Uh, more than that, you know, um, I, I would like to also uh, uh, thank uh, Mrs. Elvan that, you know, she invited me to this event and thanks for the organizers of this event. Uh, so uh, my duty here is that uh, I just, you know, uh, try to promote Turkish product and services. Uh, after I paid, you know, lots of money for our, you know, white cheese, feta, feta cheese that, the, you know, our Greek friends, uh, you know, call. You know, uh, my second, you know, most uh, important objective is to um, initiate a free trade agreement between our countries, Canada and Turkey, because, you know, I don't want to pay you know, uh, 27, you know, Canadian dollars for 600 gram of feta cheese. Uh, so uh, I'm sure that, you know, Mr. Rossi will help us. <laughs> and, you know, I will also ask your help because, you know, you have to speak with your, your local and federal, you know, politicians. And please tell them that you are also taxpayers and you deserve to get, you know, uh, your feta cheese, you know, without paying any duty tax. Thank you. Now, let me welcome our TEPAC Talks team member and board member, Ms. Sibel Joshkener, to present you our guest speakers for today's event. Dear guests, we have two distinguished guest speakers today. And our first guest speaker is Mike Ward. I first met Mike in Istanbul in 2010 when he was the Canadian consulate in Istanbul, and I was uh, the country manager for private banking RBC. So our paths crossed. <laughs> and um, I, am, I was so impressed with Mike's knowledge, hard work, and commitment to increase the trade between Canada and Turkey. 
and it's it's still continuing and um, Mike is committing all his time now for our trade and increasing our trade and um, I will read a little bit uh, about Mike's biography uh, Mike is an international trade and investment specialist with extensive public and private sector experience in pursuing commercial opportunities and trade policy issues in international markets. This includes a career in Canada's foreign service with senior assignments at Canadian embassies and consulates in Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Poland, Ukraine, Thailand, and the United States. His final diplomatic posting was as, as head of the new Canadian consulate in Istanbul when it opened in 2010. As executive director of the Canada Turkey Business Council, for the past seven years, he, he has promoted increased trade and investment between the two countries in priority sectors such as mining, energy, infrastructure, and advanced technologies. In doing this, he has worked closely with members of the CTBC's Istanbul-based partner organization, the Turkey-Canada Business Council of the Foreign Economic Relations Board of Turkey. The two business councils played pivotal roles in the governments of Turkey and Canada, agreeing to establish a bilateral joint economic and trade committee in 2019. He is also a vice president of the NATO Association of Canada. He is active in the not-for-profit affordable housing sector, serving as past president of Multifate Housing Initiative, provides affordable housing in the Ottawa area for those in need, and a current founding member of Veterans House Canada, provides affordable housing across Canada for homeless military veterans member of the governance committee of three corporate boards and chairs two of those committees. I would like to share a little anecdote with you about Mike. Uh, Mike started with all those international uh, postings and traveling um, in 1991. And at that time, um, his daughter, Alison, was four years old. And when Alison reached 15, she said, I want to go back to Canada and discover my roots. So they came back to Canada in, in the summer uh, this year, and Mike started getting some international offers, and one of them was Turkey's offer. And they had a little discussion with, um, he had a little discussion with his wife, and they agreed to uh, turn it turn it down because their daughter wants to stay in Canada. And she heard their conversation, by the way, Alison, and Alison said, no, I want to travel internationally. I like international schools. Please, let's go to Turkey. So we owe it to Alison. We are inviting Mike to make his speech. Thank you so much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And I, again, I have to thank my daughter, Allison, for, uh, for making this all possible. Um, you know, we enjoyed our time so much in, uh, in Turkey. We lived in Ankara. We lived in Istanbul. And it was an exciting time. Uh, we arrived in 2007, and there couldn't have been a better time to, uh, to be in Turkey. Um, you know, they were paying down the, soon to pay down the IMF debt. Um, so FDI was flowing into Turkey like you wouldn't believe, 20, 25 billion dollars a year. The Investment Support and Promotions Agency of Turkey, which I'll refer to in a minute, was, uh, had just been created, reporting directly to the then Prime Minister. It was the, to, as far as I was concerned, it was the center of the universe. It was a great pace, place to be. And I'll tell you, when I left, I left a little bit early. I have a son with learning disabilities, and so we decided to come back a little bit before the end of my posting. Wanted to make sure he made it through high school. And he did, without my help. But, um, but there was a lineup of people in the ministry, the Global Affairs Canada, to get, you know, to, to, to replace me for the four months that they were going you know, to be able to be there. So uh, it was a wonderful time. But, but there were still challenges. And, and some of the challenges, now let me just see if I can get the slide here. Um, in spite of this, us being two G20 countries, 
we're underrepresented in, e in each other's markets. We should do, and, and Nedim referred to it when he was talking, there needs to be more trade. There needs to be more investment in each other's markets. And now some of the reasons for this is, unfortunately, Ontario, well, fortunately, as Rocco would say, Ontario is right next door to the greatest, largest market in the world. And Rocco will promote that, works hard. I saw him uh, two weeks ago question the, um, the U.S. ambassador about we want access for auto, for batteries into the, uh, into the United States, uh, the U.S. market. So it's an extremely important market for us. So Ontario firms, if they want to go international, they don't have to go any further than the United States. Um, to think of Turkey, eh, for them is, you know, it's, well, I'll get to that in a minute. By the same token, for, Can for Turkey, it's so close to the EU. You've got the EU customs agreement. You've got, uh, there's a representative from Azerbaijan here, uh, a couple of them, I think. So, you know, there's trade with Azerbaijan, there's trade with, uh, with other countries in the region, in the MENA region. It's all right there. So it's, it's uh, so why, why Canada? If you're going to do business in North America, well, maybe the United States, but why Canada? Well, I'll tell you why in a couple of minutes. There are also Turkish issues. We hear that Turkey is far away. We hear that um, it's exotic. Somebody actually told me it's an exotic country. You don't know that much about it. Uh, uh, also, wasn't there a bomb blast there, you know, a couple of months ago? Wasn't there an attempted coup there a couple of years ago? Uh, what about the neighborhood? What about the neighborhood? So, you know, I used to live in Chicago. Talk about it, tough neighborhoods in Chicago. So, you know, don't, don't talk to me about Turkey. I, I remember, I remember going over sh shortly after the coup attempt and going down to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, Tzaltanamet right away. And I was able to tell everybody, it's wonderful here. Sent pictures, just got on social media. So, so those are the issues. And, and there are Canadian issues as well. Uh, a couple of years ago, as you may know, uh, Canada stopped issuing export permits for defense products to Turkey. Well, you know, in 2018, Turkey was our fourth largest defense export market for all of Canada. And uh, that affected some of our members, and I'll say they're former members, they're not members anymore, obviously. And some of those members lost hundreds of millions of dollars. So that really disrupted the trade. And some of those members were in Ontario. So, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't belie the fact that uh, the opportunity still exists. So, you know, I hear why Turkey, Turkey, why Ontario, but there's also why not Turkey, why not Ontario. And as you'll see later in my presentation, I'm going to talk about large and diversified G20 economies and access to third country markets. Right there, that's a great sales pitch. You know, if you're going to have a short elevator pitch, you just have to mention those two things. But there's other things that I've, I'd like to throw in. But uh, we were impacted by COVID-19, and you'll see that in a minute. Um, so what I'm, what the theme of this presentation is, you know, using the existal, existing tools to promote more trade and investment between the two countries, update the tools that need to be updated, and advocate for new tools and approaches. So some of those tools and approaches are in this slide right here. This is, these are the recent, recent milestones in commercial relations between Canada and Turkey. And it all started in 2007. I just arrived. I wanted to meet Canadian companies active in Turkey, and what we did is, that, I don't know if you, how many of you are familiar with the Sheraton in Ankara, but we uh, rented a room there, a large uh, room, big table, and we invited two dozen Canadian companies active in Turkey, and I, I hadn't met them before. I, I wanted to introduce myself, and I said, the, the gist of that was, what can we do in the next four years to help you? So we went around the table, and they came up with three things. They said, we want, we want direct flights. We'd like to have Turkish Airlines. And you know back then, you had to go through a third country. Well, you all know that. You had to go through a third country to get to Turkey. So it, it didn't help to try to get delegations going back and forth. They also wanted uh, a double taxation agreement. And of course, the, the, uh, the cherry on top would have been a consulate in Istanbul. So, um, so I, wrote a, I wrote a message back to headquarters. And I sent it to the deputy minister. And I said, I had this meeting. We had this discussion. This is what they recommended. He wrote me back and he said, great idea. Good luck. <laughs> so so um, um, it happened a month later. That was October 20, 2007. In November, I had a, attending a conference in Paris. He was there. I met him again. I said, talked to him and said, what do you think? Do you think we can get a consulate in Istanbul? Because that's what I was after. And he said, no, it's not going to happen. Too, too many. It's a great idea. I used to tell people, 
we're the only G50, G100 country that's not located in Istanbul. So uh, he said, yes, that's right, I believe you, and I know it's worthwhile, but we can't do it. So I saw his boss there, the deputy minister, Marie-Lucie Moran, I don't know if you knew her. And uh, I talked to her. I hadn't sent my note to her, but I talked to her about it. And I had a copy of the message that I'd sent to the de assistant deputy minister. I gave her that message. She asked a couple of questions. I saw her the next day. She had a smile on her face. She asked me a couple more questions. She was gone the third day. I saw him that day. I said, did you talk to her? He said, yes. I said, what did she say? He said, she told me to make it happen. So that's a short story. I wish, I wish the story had, had, had been that easy. And I'll come back to it later towards the end of my presentation. But that really helped start things rolling. The Turkish Airlines flight, we had nothing to do with. That was the airlines working together. Um, and in 20, 20, 2009, uh, Istanbul, Toronto direct flights, later on to Montreal and then to Vancouver. Uh, and then in 2010, the consulate did open. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to overemphasize, I don't want to emphasize my role because it was very small. I just got the ball rolling. Uh, but I was one of the cogs that got this thing moving. Um, and I certainly had nothing to do with the Turks opening up their consulate in Toronto. We're so glad they did, Sidham Hanum. And, uh, and, uh, and then, of course, opening up in Montreal and Vancouver. Uh, in 2012, the agreement on double taxation, again, I had nothing to do with that. But that came into effect. It, it was good and bad news. I'll come back to that later. In 2013, a Senate report came out. And the Senate report I'm gonna, is going to be the subject of my next slide, but it has some great recommendations. Um, then later on, um, probably around 2019, so excuse my typo, the OCC uh, and uh, TOBE signed an agreement, uh, a partnership agreement, and, uh, but bad timing because COVID was coming right after that. Uh, in 2019 also there was the first JETCO. Uh, the JETCO was, uh, it was, it came into force by an MOU in June of, 20, uh, of 2019, and the first JETCO me meeting took place in, uh, in, in uh, Istanbul uh, th that fall, November. And I want to say that there was a large GTA-based delegation there. So we've got center of gravity in terms of in relations with Turkey is in the GTA right now. Um, but then, of course, in 2020, COVID-19 struck. And, uh, but the good news is we're on a roll. In, um, in uh, 2023, March the 2nd, I hope you all buy tickets. I hope some of the sponsors for this event think of sponsoring us for the JETCO, uh, which will be held in Toronto March the 2nd. Just briefly on the Senate report, uh, it had a number of recommendations. These are so, some of the keys, they, and it just makes sense. If you're, if, you're a, if you're a businessman and you're looking to do business in Turkey, you're gonna wanna know what are the, what are the key sectors that we should be working on. So agriculture, mining, energy. Uh, in energy, trans infrastructure, transportation, and education. The, uh, the senators also said there should be consistent engagement at the highest political levels in order to develop a new and more uh, significant bilateral relationship. So um, it's hard to get Canadian politicians to focus on something like this with any country, even if it's a G7 country, let alone a, G a G20 country. The JETCO is going to help, but uh, w w in institutionalize interactions once a year between senior politicians on both sides and business people. But we need more of that. And it's not just at the federal level. And I'll get back to that. Uh, they, they said identify uh, Turkey as a target country for FTA negotiations. So preliminary FTA negotiations took place about 10 years ago and they went nowhere. And they went nowhere because, um, not because of the Turks. The Turks wanted an FTA, but it was the Canadian side that just, couldn't, there just didn't seem to be that groundswell of support among the business community. Um, and then they suggested that we should develop a Canada brand that profiles Canada's advantages, most notably in technology and education. So this gets to, to segue into my next slide, um, you know, when, we're, when you're exporting to Turkey, or if you're looking to invest there, look at more advanced manufacturing. It's great, sure, certainly, our major exports our, pr our primary products, uh, but, but look for the advanced manufacturing. So this got me thinking, well, what, what do the provinces do? Well, it turns out there are four provinces that ship about 92% of Canada's exports to Turkey. Uh, the largest exporter is Saskatchewan, followed by Quebec, followed by BC, and then in fourth place 
is Ontario. This is what they ship. 90% of Saskatchewan shipments to Turkey are pulses and wheat. 50% of uh, Quebec's shipments are, uh, are uh, waste iron and steel. Uh, BC, 85% is coal. Ontario. Thank you, Rocco. Machinery equipment, aircraft parts, vehicles, more advanced manufactured products. In the lead up to COVID-19, relations between, commercial relations between Turkey A and Ontario were on a roll. Uh, Ontario exports had reached an all-time high. It's too low. You'll see in the next slide what the number is. It's too low. It should have been higher, but it, it had reached an all-time high. In the previous two years, because of the good work that, uh, that the, the commercial section here did with, uh, with recruiting delegations and what the, we did on the Canadian side, there were over two dozen trade missions between Canada and Turkey in the two years before COVID hit. And then, of course, having Turkish Airlines flights, that facilitated those trips to Toronto. Um, the OCC had signed its agreement with Tobe. In the fall of 2019, the CTBC recruited the largest ever Canadian business mission to Turkey, over 60 persons. It was 62 persons, 95% were from the GTA. They attended, they, they were at well-attended conferences. We had good turnout on the Turkish side. Uh, and uh, these were in Istanbul and Ankara. There were productive B2B meetings, a minimum of eight meetings per firm. Uh, and that was through our partner, Dake. Uh, many businesses were identified and follow-up visits took place. That visit was such a success that we convinced Rocco Rossi to go to Turkey in, uh, in, in 2020. We were going to go mid-2020, around June. We were talking with the mayor's office. Sinem was there we, when we met with the mayor. And, uh, and she was leading that effort. And so um, everything was lining up. And then, of course, COVID hit. And uh, so that all-time high that we hit was only 286 million in terms of Canadian exports to Turkey, but that was three times higher than the level when we opened up our consulate in 2010. So that was a good number. And then, of course, COVID hit, and because of uh, COVID and you know also having an impact would be the declining lira, our exports fell by 50% in the next two years. And this year, they're, they're predicted to stay at about the same level they were in 2021. Turkey, on the other hand, due to the excellent people, I guess, that, that, that work in the consulate and used to work in the consulate, um, they'd, their exports had reached an all-time high also in 2019. So Canada and Turkey both reached all-time highs, respective, but they went from strength to strength. So our, 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 our exports to Turkey went down 50%. Turkey's exports to Canada went up 50%. And this year, they're up another 30%. We're projecting that they're going to be just under $2 billion by, uh, by the end of the year. Here's another uh, sort of a, uh, an example of uh, a short listing of major exports from, uh, from both countries to the other, uh, to Ontario, you know, our Ontario exports to Turkey, and Turkey's exports to Ontario. Um, and you'll see automotive is a common one. Um, lots of potential there. Um, and, uh, and in fact, there's going to be buses being exported from Turkey to Canada uh, with Mississauga Bus Company. So it's, and it's going to be in the millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. It's going to be huge. Um, but here's what I want you to think about. We should be looking to export to Turkey, not just to the country, but to the third markets, to the Azerbaijans, to the Georgias, to the EU, to the, you know, to whoever we can in the region. And the same thing, uh, that, you know, for, for Turks coming to Canada. They should be exporting to Canada with a view to going, taking advantage of some of the markets that we can access easily from, from Canada. I'll give you an example of just going to Turkey. Turkey, it'd be AGT, Saskatchewan-based uh, lentil producer. And they ship, they ship cart containers of lentils to, uh, to, uh, to Turkey. And, uh, and they're packaged there, some for the domestic market, but some for the region. And that's what you've got to think. And the same thing with the auto sector. We can get, and I'm, I'm going to switch to investment now, the APME, the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association, has discovered this year how important it would be to get Turkish automotive parts producers over, over to, uh, to, to, to Canada, to North America. And, and so they're, they're aggressively pursuing that. As well, Canadian parts producers should be over in Turkey. You, know, you can ship over, but you can follow Magnus' example, and you can for, uh, set up a plant there. 
and then you've got access to the domestic market and you could uh, and access to the region so that's what you that's what you need to think about if you're a Canadian company uh, in third in terms of third country market access well here is it it is this is this is the short elevator speech you know FTA market access to 49 countries 1.5 billion consumers and a combined GT of 52 trillion US dollars plus access to the rest of Canada Turkey offers a very good package as well, access to 1.3 billion people, combined GDP of uh, $26 trillion, uh, and you know, all within about a four-hour flight of, uh, of, uh, of Istanbul. And then, of course, very important, both offer well-developed air, sea, and land transportation infrastructure systems, which you need. Um, bilateral FTA, it's harder to get the numbers. The DTA provision, the withholding tax, of that is too high. So there's, it, it encourages Canadian investors to get into Turkey through third country markets. So um, officially, the number's about $1 billion. I'll tell you that, um, that we know that Canada is the major foreign investor in the Turkish mining sector, and Canadian investment in the Turkish mining sector is about $9 billion, not million, $9 billion. So well, well ahead of the, the official one billion in two way, you know, an investment, Canadian investment there. Where do we invest? We invest in mining, of course, automotive, energy, ICT, and infrastructure. Major Ontario investors in, in, in Turkey include Sentara Gold and Magna. And I'll tell you this, when Nortel was around, it was golden. You wanted to see a minister, a Turkish minister, didn't matter what time of day it was, didn't matter what the schedule was like, with Netash, that a company that's worth over a billion dollars right now, so the subsidiary, subsidiary of Nortel in Turkey, they would see us on anything. You needed a favor? Yes, they'd help us. Turkish bilateral investment in Canada is estimated to be about, uh, in, uh, in Ontario, in Canada is estimated to be about 150 million, but Turks tend to invest as Canadians, and of course the DTA doesn't encourage because it's that 15% that we, that we apply. Um, major Turkish investors are Anatolia Tiles, and uh, Suma Construction, and potential future Turkish investment would be in the automotive and construction sectors. And maybe there'll be more tile companies. There's a lot. They seem to be growing like, like uh, mushrooms here in, in, uh, in Ontario. Uh, more reasons to invest. Again, we hit them with this. Um, with, can, when we're talking to Turks, you know, we've got a very favorable tax system. It's a great place to start a new business. We've got an educated uh, talent pool. We're attracting foreign entrepreneurs. FDI in Canada averages about $40 billion a year. And then the key sectors. If you want to invest here, invest in these sectors. A aerospace, agriculture and agri-food, automotive, energy, environment, ICT, infrastructure, medical devices and mining. Tremendous potential. Did you know that uh, Ontario is the major mining producer in Canada? It's just, you know, all sorts of reasons to invest in Canada. And if we, when we start developing, uh, you know, other parts of Ontario with the mining sector, it's more, more potential for, uh, for Turkish investors. Um, now, the, the Turks would say, you know, Turkey's achieved uh, substantial an annual growth, GDP annual growth each year. It's terrific. Uh, it's, we're, it's a young population, skilled workers, competitive wages, lots of incentives for investment, diversified manufacturing and service sectors. Lots of potential to invest, lots of reasons to invest. Uh, it's the largest country in Europe now. Russia doesn't count anymore. You've got 87 million people, it's a huge domestic market, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's it, you know, you have to focus on it. EDC has, has lent over $11 billion in the Turkish market in the past decade, making Turkey a one of its largest portfolios. And then the key sectors there complements what we, what we publicize on our side. It's agriculture, agri-food, it's aerospace, it's automotive, it's energy, it's education, financial services. Where's Badar? Badar's here somewhere. Yes, financial services, that's for Badar. Uh, it's ICT, it's infrastructure, it's logistics, it's medical technologies. We're going to do something too on medical tourism soon. Uh, it's on mining and it's on and smart, smart cities. Those are, those are the selling points. So all of this, I'm trying to get through this fairly quickly, but all of this to say, what are, you, how, what are you going to do to harness the trade and investment potential between this province and Turkey? So if I'm an Ontario firm, 
You have to make best use of the opportunities and the tools that are available. You want to focus on the priority sectors. If, if it's working, go with it. And uh, so, so check the CTBC webpage. Check the EDC webpage. That's an excellent webpage. Um, and I've mentioned some of these sectors in the slide. We also have additional background information. And, and take advantage of the Ontario value-added advantage. Ontario, they've got the connections. You've got the track record, obviously. So just keep building on that. Um, take a look at the incentives. If you want to invest in Turkey, take a look at the incentives. Take a look at, uh, at the worker education, skilled workforce. Uh, take a look at the wages. Take advantage of that. Uh, take a look at third country market access. Is that, going to, is that a viable option for you? And uh, because that opens up many doors for you. Join the CTBC webinars. Join our trade missions. Join, come to trade shows with us. If you have a trade show that you think we should attend, let us know. Be happy to go. Um, come to the JETCO, March 2nd, Toronto. Toronto Region Board of Trade is going to be involved in it. Rocco Rossi is going to be involved with it. And uh, so, and then of course, join the CTBC. You know, um, somebody earlier was talking about, uh, Ned, it might, it might have been you, how it's important to work together. And you know, Rocky said, Rocco was a fan of, uh, you know, adherent to this as well. You know, you do so much if you work together. And, um, and so what we have to do, we're the CTBC. Who are we? Who am I? You know? It's, um, you've, got to, you've got to work with people who really count. Um, and and you, have to, you have to leverage relationships to, to, uh, to get the results that you want. So, uh, you need consistent engagement. The thing that didn't come out, that, that was recommended by the Senate report at all levels of government, from federal, provincial, municipal. Um, and, you know, uh, it's like Team Canada. I was at an event, Cinema and I, we're at a, Cinema Hanum and I were at an event uh, earlier this year by the NATO Association of Canada where former Prime Minister Jean Chrétien was the, the guest of honour. So he spoke and uh, he gave a great presentation and everyone talked about him and how, what a great job he did. You know, he was during the Quebec separation thing, the votes, he was the prime minister then. He, and he put everything on the line for that. So, um, so anyway, we were leaving and, uh, and got in the elevator and the door started to close and his arm went out. And, uh, and whoo, he walked into the elevator, Jean Chrétien. And uh, so he stood right beside me. And a uh, big, big, big point in my life, you know. I thought, you know. So, uh, you know, I played hooky from school when, when Pierre Trudeau was elected head of the Liberal Party. So it was a big deal for me. And I got in trouble with the school. But anyway, um, so, uh, so I was talking to him. Didn't have much time to talk to him. And I said, uh, Mr. Kretschia, what a wonderful evening. They certainly recognized you, praised you for all you've done, and so well deserved. But there's one thing they didn't, they didn't mention. What's that? And I said, uh, I said, well, it's the Trade Team Canada. He used to fill planes with premiers and business leaders, and he'd fly all over the world with these Trade Team Canadas. I know it was a lot of work. I know it was a pain for some of my, my colleagues at some of, the, some of the trade missions. But you know what? It put Canada on the map. And we need more of that. We need more of that. We need. Now, Rocco's a great example. He's already been over to Turkey. We were just talking earlier this evening about him coming over this, uh, this spring summer. You need that sort of, that sort of thought. Uh, the U.S. is terrific at this. You know, they established a JETCO sort of framework when Barack Obama took his first overseas trip, as you all know, it was to Turkey. One of the things that's not talked about is they formed a JETCO uh, framework, they agreed on it, when he was there. And, uh, and it, within about four or five years of that, because so many delegations came over from the U.S. Uh, federal level, you, know, you get the secretaries going over, you got, um, you got the, the state representatives going over, you got the municipalities going over, and they just flooded. You know, my friends at the American Embassy and the consulates were so overworked, and they were so happy, so happy. And that's what we should be as well. We need to be happy like that. Too much work. Give us too much work. So, so this is what we need to do. We need an FTA. So if you, have, if you know a member of parliament, tell them we need an FTA with Turkey. Um, we'll write to them, I'll write to them, but they need to hear from the business community. And uh, 
we need a revised DTA, and I sure would like to see if they could work it out, suitable to both sides, more Canadian defense exports to Turkey as well. Um, now, again, when you're doing the advocacy, you're working with uh, partners and allies. So in Ontario, OCC, front and center. Uh, you know, Rocco's here tonight. That says a big thing about what he thinks of Turkey. So this is a, you know, this is a big thing for us. Um, we, we work with the Ontario and uh, the Canadian trade officials as well in Ontario, and we work with the boards of trade. You know, Bedar's here, Brampton Board of Trade. We work with Mississauga Board of Trade. We work with the Toronto Region Board of Trade. We're look we started a women in business committee because there's so much potential. So many women in business and senior positions in Ontario and in Turkey. It's so many synergies are going to develop. Uh, in Turkey, we work with the investment agency, uh, uh, the Turkish trade officials. Uh, we work with DAIC, we work with TOPE, the Istanbul Chamber of Commerce. I'm just going to stop with one short other anecdote. I hope you don't mind. Have we got a minute? Is it okay? Okay. So it was, it was uh, October 20, 2007. We had that meeting with the Canadian companies. November, Paris, make it happen. Wonderful. It's so easy, you know. You can do something else. But there was always something else, and it was always budget-related. So um, I guess about a year later, it looked like the money that was earmarked for the Turkish consulate was going to have to go to a, another priority. There was, a, there was a disaster somewhere else, and they were going to need the money. They were going to have to airlift people out of somewhere or build a consulate somewhere else. So uh, a good friend of mine was Alpha's Land Korkmaz. And I don't know if, if you know him. Alpha's Land Bay was the first president of the ISPAT, Investment Support and Promotion Agency of Turkey. And he'd been to the United States, and I kept saying, Alpha's Land, you've got to go to Canada. And he said, I know I do. There's so much potential. So, so a year later, in 2008, I'm, I'm worried we're going to lose this consulate, and this is the thing I'm really working for. And uh, so I, I got together with them, and I said, you know, when are you going to when are you going to go to the United States again? And he told me. I said, well, could you add Canada to the to the to the trip? He said, of course I will. So I went to work, and I made a couple of meetings for him with uh, the deputy minister who I'd met in Paris, with the minister, um, and with uh, the head of EDC. So over he went. And uh, so maybe a month or two later. And I said, so he came back, and I said, how did the meetings go? He said, oh, they're pretty good. But I, he said, I can't promise anything. You know, I did my best. I made my pitch. We'll see what happens. So uh, about a month or two later, we found out that the funding had been found. And the thing did go ahead. Now, there were other hiccups. My, my, I was fed up with it, to be honest with you, by then. It was just too much of a roller coaster, and it was out of my hands anyway. But, uh, but they went ahead and they, they opened it. So sometimes, I'm finishing now, you're next. Uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, so sometimes, you know, you can work really hard. And I always tell my kids, work really hard. But, but sometimes that's not good enough. Sometimes you have to be at the right place, at the right time, with the right people. And I was then, and I am now. And thank you very much for inviting me here tonight. Our second guest speaker is Rocco Rossi. Uh, when I listened to Rocco's speech a few years back at the CTBC's uh, conference, I was so impressed with his knowledge about the trade potential between Turkey and Ontario and his commitment to improve it. Rocco Rossi is the president and CEO of Ontario Chamber of Commerce, a successful entrepreneur and business executive, champion fundraiser, and dedicated public servant. Rocco Rossi joined the Ontario Chamber of Commerce in 2018 as president and CEO. Prior to joining the OCC, Rossi most recently served as president and CEO of Prostate Cancer Canada, where he helped to advance the research, advocacy, education, and awareness of the most common cancer in men. Mr. Rossi also served as CEO of Heart and Stroke Foundation, one of Canada's largest nonprofit organizations, overseeing consecutive years of record fundraising combining for over $500 million in total, 
and launching many new life-saving initiatives. Mr. Rossi has held senior positions at the Boston Consulting Group, Torstar, Labat Interbrew, and MGI Software. He is a graduate of McGill and Princeton. And did you know that Rocco has walked 15 pilgrimages in Western Europe along the several of the legendary Como de Santiago? Yes, we are inviting Rocco to give his speech. Thank you so much. It's, uh, and thanks to Tipak for inviting me. Um, it fulfilled one of my major dreams in life, and that is to have Mike Ward as my warm-up act. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, and uh, I, um, I'm so delighted to, to be here with Sinohanam uh, Mehmet Bey, dear friend for, for many years. Um, and I have to admit that Ahmet is the sneakiest commercial counsel I've ever met in my life, right? Because think about it. Think about it, he wants to free cheese, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and what's the best way to get an Italian to think about cheese? Put him next to a massive wine rack. <laughs> so very sneaky, I'm on to your game here. I, and it's typical of what I've, what I've encountered with uh, people from uh, Turkey. Think about it, just the other side of, um, of that column, there's a sign that says, the capacity is 72. And on this side, it says it actually is 60. And I think there's about 150 people. So this is the typical Turkia philosophy, under promise and over deliver. <laughs> and regulations are really more guidelines than anything else. Let's just get stuff done. Really, really important. Um, I want to... Uh, start off with two things which are two thanks uh, to Turkey because the title of the, the speech is supposed to be Enhancing Trade for Economic Competitiveness. And the very first trade, the most important trade from my perspective that Canada made because <laughs> we got all of the benefits and it didn't cost us anything is all of you and those that you represent in the diaspora because this country is phenomenal because it has been able to attract the best of the best from everywhere in the world. I'm the child of immigrants. And for years I've had people say, well, of course, people are gonna wanna leave misery to come to Canada and it's all great and it's all fantastic. No, no, there are lots of people in very difficult circumstances who don't go, who don't leave. Because guess what? It takes enormous courage and sacrifice to leave your country, to leave what you know, as bad as it may be. It is what you know. It is where your blood is. It is where your family is. It is where your roots are. To give that up, to come somewhere, takes the kind of courage that I want to build a country on. Right? Because you get those kind of people and you take on the world. So thank you for that trade, number one. Didn't cost us anything, so I think Canada did pretty well on that deal. The second is an enormous thanks to President Erdogan over a deal that has not gotten anywhere near enough coverage. Just a couple weeks ago, there was a renewal of a deal that was cut in July that has ensured that millions upon millions upon millions of tons of Ukrainian and Russian wheat is getting to people who need food and is helping to moderate what otherwise would be, look, as bad as inflation is for us, it's a hell of a lot worse if you're some Bedouin in Tunisia that's trying to feed your family and suddenly faced with rapidly increasing prices. So that is crucial. 
And that was made possible by the relationship that the president has developed with Mr. Putin. But it is a double-edged sword. For all of the advantages, and Mike is absolutely right laying them out, there is a danger. And it has nothing to do with exoticism, right? Mike talked about the incredible Team Canada approach of Prime Minister Kretschmann. And Prime Minister Kretschmann was part of a movement in the West that since the Second World War has believed fundamentally in a hypothesis, which was that the more we liberalize trade with everyone in the world, we may not create democracies everywhere, but generally speaking, you're going to lower the temperature on inter-country violence, and you're going to create a more peaceful world and a more prosperous world. Mr. Putin's invasion of Ukraine threw that assumption out the window. The actions of the Chinese for the last several years in terms of IP theft, in terms of kidnapping and imprisoning Canadian citizens and other actions around the world have changed that assumption. There is no question that trade benefits all of the participants at the end of the day. It doesn't necessarily benefit equally and it doesn't necessarily benefit every person at every moment within the countries, but long term, it's a winner. The belief though in just-in-time inventory and in globalizing your supply chains Get it wherever it's cheapest, bring it just in time for your needs in your market. That worship is over. As good as just in time was, and it helped to generate trillions of economic value across the globe, what COVID, what supply chain shocks, what's happened in China and now the invasion of the Ukraine, it's turned from just in time to just in case. Supply chains are going to be built for redundancy. They're going to be built for resilience. They're going to be built with people that you trust. And so it is fundamental, it is fundamental to be part of that circle within which you're going to be considered friendshoring. And as important as the relationship is with Russia, and it was crucial in doing this deal that I just talked about, going too far from the perspective of the West will become a problem. Already is a problem was a problem in those defense sales. I mean, look, I'm a friend. I'm a supporter. And friends tell friends the truth. Why were defense sales stopped? Because of the fear that Western technology would end up in Russia. And we know because we look at the missiles that are being collected in the Ukraine, that there are chips showing up from Western economies. Because quite frankly, the Russian economy is no longer what it was as the Soviet Union. The Russian economy is smaller than the Canadian economy. It is a dangerous country because of its military powers, because of its nuclear powers, because it has weaponized energy with Western Europe, but it is no longer a principal player in global economics. And the West, and I'm here, I'm talking the United States, and I really encourage anyone and everyone to download the October 
national security strategy document that was published by the White House. And you don't have to go through the whole 48 pages. Go through the first two pages, the letter supposedly written by President Biden, where it effectively says, look, Russia is an acute threat, but the real challenge, the real challenge going forward is a country that has both the capability increasingly and the desire to change the global world order, and that is China. So you saw the CHIPS Act, you saw the Inflation Reduction Act, you're seeing additional activities uh, in terms of changes in supply chain, Apple reducing its exposure in China. It's not to say that these are going to be cut off completely. That's not, but it's going to be reduced. And so you can be sure that Western countries have looked at the fact that there are only really three countries that have expanded exports to Russia since the sanctions came in. And those are China, Turkey, uh, and, and Korea. And that will be remembered, right? So there, there are consequences to choices that have relatively little to do whether it's exotic or not, or whether we move from a jet code to a free trade agreement, and it's not Look, I, I, I want cheaper feta. Trust me. I, I love white cheese. I want more of it. I don't want to pay as much. But the reality is that the way the world is shaping up now, it is asking people to make choices. I'm not saying it's fair. Right? It's not right. And, and look, the West has not been perfect by any means. Uh, and it has its fair share of issues, but we are going into block trading. That seems clear. Uh, and, and so those choices that countries make will be examined very, very closely, um, and, and you have to decide. You have to decide of where the balance is going to go. And I think Turkey has enormous opportunities within that that should be even more attractive to Canada, to the United States, to the West, to Europe in general. And I just want to point to a couple of potential highlights that maybe don't get the attention that they deserve. How many people know very much about graphite? Right? Aside from the fact that you think they go into pencils, graphite is crucial for electric batteries. You need graphite to do the anode that combines with the cathode within an electric lithium ion battery. Guess what? Turkey has 28% of the global reserves of graphite. Canada currently, I mean, despite our massive landmass, because mineral prospecting has been slowed for a lot of NIMBY reasons that will have to be revisited as we think about the green transition, as we think about national security issues, because the other side of that trade is China controls most of the processing of graphite into the form that you need for electric batteries. So a combination of mineral extraction plus processing plus automotive parts into one of the most important parts of the future, Turkey can play a big role but that's a decision on how to move forward, right? Um, but that is a crucial area, and I, I was just Monday with the Prime Minister and the Premier in Ingersoll for the opening of the first scale EV plant 
in Canada, like there are billions of dollars at stake here in that transition. Uh, and, and so that will be crucial. Supply chain issues as, move, as moves are made outside of China and with the young and highly educated workforce that Turkey has, there's opportunities to take a share of that business. But you're going to have to be seen as on side. Um, and that is a difficult, and I, I, I fully recognize it's a difficult situation. And the platform argument that Mike made is the last thing I leave you with, and it's just a, a, an interesting factoid that I think uh, is important for the entire world to recognize. In 1900, Europe had three times the population of the entire continent of Africa. By 1993, Europe and Africa had identical populations. By 2020, Africa is the equivalent of two Europes. By 2037, Africa will be the equivalent of three Europes. And by 2050, Africa will be the equivalent of four Europes. So when you think about the neighborhood and the ability to play and to help Canadian companies navigate, because Turkish companies are there. Canadian companies, by and large, aren't because we've been super lucky, fat, and lazy in some expect, just looking south of the border because it's been really easy, relatively speaking, to do. But we're going to need partners to navigate in the world. And I think Turkey can be a critical part of that through the MENA region into Africa. Uh, and part of a key green transition and building a supply chain that allows uh, the West to counter uh, what's going on with, uh, with China and Russia. But those are choices for us to make. Let's make the right ones. Thank you. Can I please get a big round of applause for Mr. Rocco Rossi and Mr. Mike Ward. Now, we'll move on to the Q&A section for the next 20 minutes. Our volunteer, Jane, will be assisting you with the mic. Any questions for our speakers today? Um, you know that that's being shaped as we as we speak. Uh, you've seen the announcement by um, uh, the Canadian government of a new Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. That's certainly not a, a hard cordon. We're not. I hope we never come back to a East Bloc, West Bloc, uh, and walls. Um, but the reality is you're going to be looking at, you know, North America, the, um, the, uh, the USMCA, the, the EU, some combination of the CPTPP uh, countries, India, um, and then we'll see where the others um, fit in. Uh, the flip side is what, uh, what China has been trying to do with the uh, Belt and Road uh, strategy and those that will align with that together with, uh, with Russia, North Korea, and, uh, and a few other players. 
My question is, uh, as, as you know, I'm sure you know, but recently in a gray list, which allegedly uh, uh, party of uh, some uh, money transfer and question is, uh, what is the impact of uh, uh, in, on the trade being in a gray list? Uh, and what's your opinion if Turkey is going to be on the black list? And what would be the impact and the consequences of that case? Thank you. Look, I, you know, they're, they're, I, I'm not a Boy Scout. I mean, we, we don't in a black and white world, there's a whole <laughs> lot of gray out there. Um, that said, uh, the more it's seen as systemic, uh, the more if it was actually seen as um, as government condoned or at least not uh, a government that's not going to then do the work to try to shut it down, uh, that'll be a problem. That'll be a problem. Um, and... Um, Look, this is, uh, it's, in, it's in the world. If the world is going to a world of friend shoring, so we still want to keep as maximum a, a trading um, market as possible, but within uh, groups of countries that share values and, and share uh, regulations, laws, uh, approaches, those things are going to be important. I mean, the, the, the very unconventional interest rate policy in Turkey is also an issue for a lot of companies. I got to I got to say, it's, uh, you know, it's 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 difficult when you're seeing the rest of uh, of the developed economies take one way and one country deciding that. No, that's wrong. Maybe they win the Nobel Prize in economics, but I don't think so. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time and participation today. I'm here, yeah. short term. <laughs> <laughs> so considering that many of our uh, participants here is entrepreneurs, and as uh, as uh, community of the Turkey while we, um, you know, decide where we are going to, which direction we are going to go in the next decade. Maybe we can discuss how we can integrate the current Turkish immigrant entrepreneurs to the existing local supply chains of Canadian manufacturers. So what will be your suggestions and recommendations for those Turkish entrepreneurs who would like to provide services to the Canadian manufacturers in terms of digitalization, transformation, project management, and all type of you know, uh, capacity of Turkey, the entrepreneurs of Canada, uh, manufacturers of Canada. Thank you. Well, the first step is to join Batter at the Brampton Board of Trade or at the Mississauga. I mean, really, it's a, it's a tailor-made question, but that's, that's how we build our networks. That's how we present our members to our larger members to make sure they're part of the supply chain. Um, you, you know, you, you, you go, uh, you fish where the fish are, right? And, and those are the chambers of, tra uh, chambers of commerce and boards of trade. Uh, it's, it's great, like I, I come, as obviously my name points out, um, I'm Irish. Uh, so, uh, you know, Rock O. Rossi is my name, actually. Um, but no, you know, the, the Italians, we, we used to just look within our own community, our own businesses, um, and more and more, we've just become mainstream uh, and part of, uh, of the general business. So it's, it was important, for instance, the Italian Chamber of Commerce, and still plays, still plays a role but a very different role than it did 50 years ago. Um, because most of those, those people, particularly the ones that have grown, um, uh, became parts of these other 
boards of trade and chambers in order to be part of the mainstream uh, conversation. You can't, you can't ghettoize yourself. I'll just add to that. We need more Turks, skilled Turks here in Canada. Big time. Big time. And, um, you know, there's problems with getting visas for, for people to come over, as we all, everybody in this room knows. Uh, that's an issue that has to be sorted out. I can't believe it that I can get a visa sitting in front of my computer to go to Turkey. But for somebody who wants to come to Canada, it's a long, drawn-out process. And you have to, and I have people calling me up, sending me emails. We're trying to get people over for training. They need to come over from, from, uh, from Izmir, get training in Ottawa. But it's not being processed. The applications with it not being processed. We need them. You know, there's, um, so I live in Ottawa. Uh, Terry Matthews with Wesley Clover, he invests in, uh, he's an angel investor, and he invests in Turkish, the, the, the you know, the startup communities there. And, uh, and, and some of those com uh, companies are, are, as an angel investor, they're growing and they're coming to Canada, they're going to the United States as well, establishing bases. You've got, Turkey's got such a good reputation for high class, you know, well-educated, very professional people. And we need more of that in Canada. So whatever we can do to, to advance it, and I, the governments recognize the importance of bringing, uh, bringing more investors. Leuna, the big uh, construction union here, recognizes the importance and advocates for it. The consulate advocates for it. We all advocate for it. We'd like to see more of it happen. And as Rafa said, you guys are great examples of the success yeah. of coming to Canada. And, it, and it's not just the white collar. I mean, uh, Mike raises the, the point about, uh, about Layuna, uh, which is a huge one. Um, the latest discussion I had with the Minister of Immigration is we have to make sure that we're bringing people to Canada, not only who want to buy a house, but can actually build a house. Um, <laughs> and Turkey has one of the, the largest sources of skilled construction workers uh, left in Europe. Um, and um, um, certainly there are going to be enormous opportunities on the trades side. I mean, I, like my, my parents did it from a young age. My father said that if he ever saw me on a construction site, he would, he would, he would beat me. Um, because he said, look, we came to this country, we had no education, we had to work with our backs. Uh, that's what we needed to do to put food on the table. But you, you're going to go to university, uh, you're going to wear a suit, you're going go to you're gonna shower at the beginning of the day, you're going to go to the office, you're going to come home with clean hands. That was the definition of success for them. And the net result of that is my plumber can buy and sell me four times over. <laughs> He's got a place in Georgian Bay, another in Scottsdale, Arizona. He runs a million dollar business. If he doesn't like you as a client, you're gone because he's got a long list. We need skilled trades, big time. Uh, that is an enormous opportunity. And for all of you talking to your kids, there's some great opportunities and it's not all white collar. The average welder at Darlington, at the uh, nuclear reactor refurbishment project, the average welder is making between one hundred and fifty and two hundred thousand dollars a year. Hi, <coughs> Baron Carson, TEPAC board member. Uh, thank you very much to both of you for your valuable participation. Uh, Sorry for that. I have some uh, injury. Uh, yeah, I understand very well. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, I had attended another presentation, I believe, Ontario Chamber of Commerce with the Honorable Paul Martin at this time. This was in 2009, just before the Canadian trade mission to Turkey, uh, Mike. I remember an interesting statement at this presentation. Globalization will be reduced. We will have probably one TV set costing 1500 instead of three TV sets costing 500 each. This was a very interesting 
statement I still remember, and this was in 2009, uh, giving a message about reduced globalization. And what we discussed today and heard from you, we are moving in this direction and choices are important. Uh, in connection with this, you also mentioned this huge Belt and Road Initiative by China, and China is expected about $20 trillion for this project over the years, which is a staggering amount. So on the one hand, we are talking about choices, and at the other end, There are at least one huge reason for a better globalization with this uh, Belt and Road Initiative by China. So my question is, is this really a big off for a much higher globalization or is this project more a huge infrastructure for final Chinese dominance or the reality is probably something in between. What do you think about this? Look, I, I actually, um, I see it as a different kind of globalization. I don't actually <coughs> see it as less globalization because actually from Canada's perspective, we've always wanted to diversify uh, away from the enormous dependence we have on the United States. So, uh, so I, I see in the future of friendshoring actually greater diversification from a Canadian perspective, but it's not with the assumption that it doesn't matter anybody in the world anywhere at any time. That, that I think is being challenged now and is going to be problematic for the next several years. I don't know how long. I'm not. Uh, I'm not an oracle, uh, but I just look at those national security strategy documents and it's pretty black and white uh, and the decisions that are being made. Um, clearly the Chinese are doing a couple of things uh, with Belt and Road. Um, there, there is uh, a projection of power, but there's also, and this is particularly the work that they've done in Africa, um, there is a cornering of as much critical minerals as possible um, where, they, where they don't actually mine it in China. They, uh, they process most of these things. So whether it goes from cobalt to tantalum to niobium, uh, all really crucial uh, minerals that they've been trying to lock up in their deals. But you're starting to have some of those countries, um, you know, not necessarily seeing the, the, the full benefits of the Chinese model of globalization because they'll bring their own workers. Yes, they'll, they'll be a certain payment to the local government, but then they bring their own workers and they, you know, build their own railway and, and focus on, on shipping out to, uh, to their needs. Um, so I think there will be, there will be competing uh, visions and people get to make choices, right? And then live with the consequences. But I, I think that I, I'm not, I, I'm not a, a believer, nor do I think we inevitably go into more protectionism, but I think the, the definition of what is global is, is reduced. But from our standpoint, that's actually increased from just shipping everything to the United States. And Daryl, if you, if you take, um, just take, don't take a look at the critical minerals, isn't it fascinating how countries are now working together? And uh, you know, Canada's part of it, Europe part of this. Uh, so you know, we've got lithium in Canada, we've got uh, graphite in, uh, Turkey. in Turkey. So uh, you know, so new alliances are, are, are emerging at this time. And, and China, it's not the, it's not the, it's, it's a big economy for sure. It will always be a big economy, but it's not as big as it was in terms of, it's, it's, uh, 
uh, uh, recommend, you did a TED talk recently, didn't you, on supply chain. 20 minutes, I don't know how we did it. Timed it exactly 20 minutes. And, um, and uh, but, but supply chain is, that is such a fascinating topic. You could have a, t you could have a discussion about that as well, but how that's shaping, shaping up in the world, supply chains are forming. And Turkey A can play a role in that, big role. Yeah. Thank you, my turn. <laughs> so uh, I, got, I got a capital markets question for you. Um, I've had a chance to take a look at uh, the top 100 uh, Turkish companies. Invariably, while they're all uh, owned uh, by one major Turkish shareholder, they're also, in most cases, partnerships with Europeans. Uh, even, even the largest airport in Turkey, Istanbul Airport, is jointly owned by the government of Turkey with investors from, from Europe. So in an environment where the largest companies in Europe are in bed with Turkish manufacturers to lower their cost of manufacturing and also to use those links to tap into the growing Turkish middle class, which is benefiting from that investment in Turkey, how do we expect Canadian businesses to compete with Europe under the CETA agreement without having the same alternatives available to us? Uh, it's a it's a great uh, it's a great question, um, and uh, and look at we there is a there is a narrower view. I'm not saying it's mine, but uh, it would be by some that look at um, Kuzma USMCA NAFTA 2.0 um, that effectively. Mexico is to the U.S. and Canada what Turkey is to the EU. Uh, young population, uh, significantly lower uh, wage costs, um, and you look at the way, for instance, our automotive parts uh, and assembly work is done to make sure that you create that, that competitive uh, nature on that, uh, on that basis. You're, the reality is, uh, and I, I go back to competitive advantage, you're not going to compete on, on all things. There are going to be things that, um, that the combination that uh, an EU country with, with, uh, with uh, Turkey has um, will be more competitive, and there'll be things that we doing either from a technology standpoint, a value-added standpoint, or in conjunction with uh, our Mexican partners, or other partners around the world, growing the uh, Indo uh, the Indo Pacific strategy, growing our CPTPP, growing our relationship, our free trade agreement with South Korea. So uh, you're not going to compete on all things, but capital markets question. You take a look at how badly EU markets have been doing. Uh, relative to the U.S. over this period, and quite frankly, you know, I think we got the more dynamic horse right now. Good answer. Okay, this marks our last question then. Can I ask a question? One more? Yeah. Okay. Last, last. Last, last. Yes. <laughs> so thank you for these spreads. For a talk, Mr. Ward and Mr. Rossi. I am Marcus Ajar. I am studying in McMaster University Computer Science and I am from Turkey as well. So, my question will be uh, about a little like defense and the aerospace industry. Uh, as you know, Turkey is a member of NATO, and uh, because of the strategic location and the military uh, support to NATO members in that area, it has an important, it has a important uh, place in NATO. As you know, in last April actually and the last November, uh, Canada cancelled uh, some high technology arms uh, to Turkey. So that means the embargo for the defense industry. Uh, specifically, like if I give an example, it was one of the Baikar cameras, which uh, they, procedure, they produced that cameras in Burlington, Ontario actually. So what are the last uh, improvements or developments that there are between 
uh, collaboration between the Canada and Turkey in the industry of gas and star space. Thank you. Uh, I mean, Mike can uh, bring you up. But yes, uh, a really crucial uh, NATO ally that also did an arms deal with, uh, with Russia. And quite frankly, that makes things very complicated. Um, and and I, I, I understand that uh, it's, it's complicated from Turkey's situation that either, okay, so if we're in, you gotta show us that we're, we're totally in. Uh, you know, we've been sitting at the door of the EU all of this time, we wanna be uh, treated in the same way, but, but playing the game, it's a complicated and dangerous game to try to balance partnering and trading uh, with the rest of NATO and, and doing anything on the military side uh, with Russia. Uh, that's just a very uh, difficult circumstance, made even more difficult now because of, uh, of uh, the Ukrainian invasion. So I would not expect any quick uplift uh, in defense business with, with Turkey until that is made far clearer. But Mike, you have a different or say. No, 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 no. <laughs> I agree with everything. But I think what you also want to keep in mind is that high tech technology is not just the defense sector. So it's across sectors. It's in agriculture. It's in mining. It's in uh, healthcare. And that's where we really have an opportunity to work together. Uh, and so with the, at the university level, in research and development, uh, so, so maybe it won't be defense, not, not in the near future, but in a whole range of other sectors with, uh, with, through, through industries uh, and working together collaboratively. So much potential. Thank you. I'd like to invite TEPAC President Mr. Nedim Duzani to present certificates of appreciation to our guest speakers, Mr. Rocco Rossi and Mr. Mike Ward, as well as our newest main sponsor, GSK Personal Injury Law. Please welcome to the stage Mr. Rocco Rossi and Mr. Mike Ward once again. <laughs> Thank you very much. And please welcome to the stage Ms. Selva Gulieva representing GSK Personal Injury Law. to the end of our third TEPAC Talks event. We wish to see you in our first TEPAC Talks event in 2023 on March 8th. If you would like to receive more information about TEPAC, keep following us on our Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook pages, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Now, let's network. Thank you, everyone.